So uh, I'm going to talk more on the union side of things. Dale has mentioned a few things. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about um, <coughs> how some of these multi-employer structures generally work in the United States. It's um, hard to overgeneralize because, or it's hard to generalize at all because, um, as I put on the bottom part of this, um, I think uh, John Dunlop used to always say, all construction is local. If you've heard the saying, all politics is local, all construction and all wage bargaining is local as well. There are some national patterns, but um, on the ground, it's the locality that matters quite a bit. Um, uh, why, uh, I've mentioned before why uh, focus on multi-employer, but why the building and construction trades in particular um, is that they uh, often involve multiple employers and either single or multiple craft union bargaining structure. Um, they're, as Dale mentioned, based on hours of work, which is different um, than a lot of other collectively bargained contracts, um, but maybe similar to some of the so-called newer forms of uh, work that we're seeing emerge in other industries. Um, and uh, these kind of jointly managed structures, of course, legally in the United States, can't really do much of that um, outside of the collective bargaining structure. Um, although we are starting to see some areas where self-employed are banding together and trying to form some kind of associations. Um, sometimes that's accepted by unions, sometimes not. Um, and the trades often um, embrace new technologies and they, but not always. Uh, so, um, so they're gonna see success um, oftentimes when they develop responsive training and deployment programs, but as I will discuss sometimes, um, the jurisdictional differences can really um, you know, determine how are they're gonna respond to technology. So the uh, experience with organizing and serving members has of course been quite mixed. I don't wanna be Pollyannish about it <laughs> in construction and the building, uh, the building trades in the United States. Um, and there are certainly not only legal differences across countries, but within the states and now even within municipalities and so on too. So it does make it very difficult to generalize. I'm just gonna mention a few um, things, uh, and Dale's mentioned most of these already, so I'll just click through. I've, I wasn't completely um, comprehensive in representing brothers and sisters in the uh, US construction trades here, but just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that, um, that they're still involved in, very much so. Um, one is also pre-apprenticeship, um, and that's trying to develop interest in the trades attempting to address <coughs> diversity, providing flexibility for economic development job uh, objectives and so on. They're actually um, fairly common um, in things like project labor agreements, which Dale's done quite a, a lot of research on as well. Um, in addition to the kind of basic skills, sometimes it's basic math skills in apprenticeship programs, um, but also craft um, identity is formed in these apprenticeship um, programs. They give a lot of union history, policies and procedures, um, law, it's, and even like a management training and that sort of thing. Um, and there are these um, sometimes very big training institutes. So part of that cents per hour contribution is also going to um, funding with employers, um, training institutes to teach skills, not just an apprenticeship, but ongoing training, um, safety and health, new technologies, um, and even things like journeyman leadership or construction management courses. Um, the hiring hall, of course, is a long-standing feature of the trades, um, which is basically rationing work, um, getting people out to the job sites. Um, also forms kind of a function of uh, making sure that those wage and be benefit agreements are upheld. So. Um, the health and welfare funds, um, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on multi-employer plans, uh, pension plans. Um, that's uh, another part of this somehow that, I'm not sure that got on there. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but that's a big part of this too, multi-employer health and welfare funds. Um, supporting workers and their families, um, even doing things like screening and early detection. Um, so you can see like the, the extent to which some of these unions are involved with their membership. Um, again, not all of them, but, um, and also another thing that I'll talk about in a little more detail is dispute resolution systems, which I think is a really important part of the new gig economy or the old gig econ economy, whatever we want to call it. Um, 
in a, in a number of different ways, jurisdictional disputes between um, construction trades, um, crafts, and member-to-member -member disputes, member-to-employer, um, rights disputes, and interest disputes. Um, oh, there it is, financial intermediaries. Um, pension funds, life insurance, I put the ULICO label down there, <laughs> that's Union Labor Life Insurance Company. Um, and so there are quite a lot of these examples of these kind of multi-employer funds. Um, <clears throat> as Dale also mentioned, the national joint level boards have a really long-standing history. Um, and the, uh, the longest standing one is uh, the Council on Industrial Relations for the Electrical Contracting Industry. It's an interesting, um, <laughs> CIR, um, was an interesting board because it would have um, six representatives from labor and six representatives from management. And they would have to have, they would hear um, cases from their membership, either employer side or the membership side, and would decide on these things and they would have to decide on them unanimously. So there have been thousands and thousands of unanimous decisions that this board has come up with. It's a way to try to keep the US um, uh, construction industry or electrical industry functioning smoothly. The last thing they want to have is a whole lot of strikes and um, you know service not being provided to customers. I get really mad when my power goes out. Right? <laughs> um, and plus the nature of the industry is one where they just really want to keep that quality of um, electrical work um, front and center. And so they try to do, I've attended one of the hearings, they try to do, um, uh, it's, it's really quite unique. They, you know, it's people who understand the industry. So if you have to go to an arbitrator, um, who doesn't understand the industry at all, doesn't know all the language, and it can take a very, very long time for decisions to be made. They hear these cases in one day, and usually they're making that decision that evening. So it's a very quick, even if it's not maybe the best outcome, it is an outcome. Usually the, participation, the participants are okay with it because they can move forward. Um, so it's really um, quite a unique kind of situation. It was. Um, basically designed 1919, 1920 to try to overcome the kind of labor strife that was occurring in the 1919. Um, and others have followed suit um, having these kind of boards. Um, most of the time those board decisions are upheld by the courts. There's a recognition that if they enter into these agreements and they agree on these things that, that <coughs> they're bound to those. Um, I'll probably skip over these a little bit in the interest of time. But um, the thing to point out here is that these grievance settlements can sometimes affect other employers who may not be party to the agreement. And they often include more than one contractor and more than one union representative within the industry. There's also project labor agreements where the owner, and Dale could talk more about that, um, where the owner becomes party to the agreement. Um, and the, uh, there are these pre-hire agreements between the project owner, manager, and unions. Um, sometimes the owner, it's usually their private kind of uh, projects, but they could be public projects, say a stadium where they want to hire um, some people from you know, a poorer part of town and give them entry to good construction jobs, and the unions may agree to that. Um, uh, uh, as, as it fits. Um, again, you could talk about more of that. <laughs> um, and, uh, but that those grievances oftentimes are handled through whatever, if there is a, a board at a national level, they're still oftentimes handled through um, those boards. Um, just to talk about technology a little bit, um, prefabricated structures have increasingly been incorporated into design and building. Um, there was much consternation about this when I worked in D.C. with the trades. Um, and, uh, you know, one, uh, on the one hand, bad for carpenters and some other trades. On the other hand, not so bad for Teamsters who are moving some of these structures to the job sites. Um, so there's oftentimes a trade-off there. Um, plus, these become manufacturing jobs, not um, necessarily construction jobs. Um, this is not entirely new. I'm showing you pictures from my a recent trip to Cambodia that I took. <laughs> so these were from Cambodian temples in about 1100 or so. Uh, you can see they have hard hats, but uh, thanks. 
uh, but no shoes, <laughs> putting some of these back together. These are, uh, in a sense, kind of recyclable building materials, which is the next thing that people are talking about, um, especially in Europe, um, because deconstruction is um, becoming even as important as construction. Um, but I think uh, we can see 3D printing really revolutionizing construction moving forward. Again, probably moving some of this um, work that was previously done on a job site to manufacturing. Um, uh, here's something virtual reality and augmented reality is already a big part of construction as well. Um, in fact, I saw this on the news the other night where they were showing a job site and um, the, all, you could see all the lines from all the lasers everywhere, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, but the thing to, you know, these are, again, these aren't things that are insurmountable. Here's, um, I went and visited the uh, Pacific Northwest Carpenters Institute um, and right there on their website, they have, you know, uh, training that members can receive on these things. So it's not like a definitely a huge threat to them. Um, they understand that the incorporation of new technologies is very important um, to their um, being in demand on the work sites. Uh, Multi-employer pensions, um, as Dale mentioned, they have special allowance under 1947 labor law, um, but they're also in quite a lot of peril. Um, some are doing quite well, but we have, um, many of them are vulnerable um, to political as well as collective bargaining challenges. U.S. construction has, uh, unionized construction has declined to, what is it, 14% or something right now? Uh, blue collar is probably 21. Yeah, yeah, a little bit higher maybe, um, but not 50%. No. no okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, part of the problem that arises from this is that the pension funds carry a pretty heavy withdrawal liability. Um, so that keeps a lot of employers from really, uh, and, um, people from really wanting to participate in this. Um, but there is this understanding that you enter into this uh, multi-employer relationship, if you leave, then you have to um, have some liability, some stake in the system here. Um, and if they don't join though, it means that they're kind of free riding on career construction workers. So, um, there are about 9% of multi-employers having about 23% of uh, multi-employer plans having about 23% partici of participants at really high risk of losing benefits. Um, I believe that loss to families because if they are not getting income, they're having to supplement that somehow. It could be in the range of billions of dollars. Um, there are a lot of principal agents problems in pension fund management that are problematic as well. Um, but when we look at some of these, um, there, uh, there's a recent study um, that about a 114 Taft-Hartley funds, and this is all industries, not just construction, because you can have them, like for instance, the mu musicians fund um, is also a fund, is also a multi-employer fund. That is the uh, yeah, central states, that's, that's what I have up there. Ah. The green there, <laughs> thank you. The, the green is, uh, most of this is the, as you can see, um, almost nearly half of it is the Teamsters Central Pension Fund, Central States Pension Fund. The, actually, the Western, Teamsters Western pension, pension States Fund is doing fairly well. So we have these kind of really different experiences. Um, and it's just, there's a really, um, thanks, there's a really kind of um, uh, bad press around that. <laughs> but it's a huge problem. Uh, unionization rate is low, lots of challenges, and uh, the craft orientation is pretty strong. Um, oh, one thing I want to mention here is that operations of funds like an uh, operating funds like an employer means that unions have to deal with all the compliance kind of issues that uh, that a, uh, an employer would have to deal with. So compliance with Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, um, sending workers to the job site, they could be um, have claims of discrimination. I've mentioned before regulations are often unclear when more than one employer is involved. Um, the system's kind of vulnerable to co corruption or at least claims of corruption corruption, um, certainly principal agent problems, and um, it just takes an enormous amount of financial and uh, uh, financial investment 
management to investment. He took some of my time, so. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and just an enormous, enormous amount of trust between unions, members, employers, employer associations, and owners in the case of project labor agreements. So um, how can we maybe move forward? Looking at controlling, um, you know, some of the things that David Weil mentioned in his book is um, those, and that he tried to work as, uh, out as director of wage and hour division, um, were things like who's the controlling employer. Um, the problem in the United States is that different agencies have different definitions of employment, so um, who's counted as an employee. And so uh, looking also at this misclassification issues, Weil also mentions really important Importantly, that mapping these business relationships and I think you know the value chain kind of issues are really important in terms of tracking players influencing workplace conditions um, he also mentioned that uh, maybe we could look more at government contracting um, and really uh, enforce some uh, uh, or develop hot cargo provisions for reg for regulators wanting to punish those that aren't complying um, of course it's not going to really help in places like residential construction where they might be flying under the radi radar so often, um, and uh, maybe supporting multi-employer benefit structures through legal change oversight and so on. So I think there um, are plenty of examples of successes and failures. Um, there could be some um, promises uh, here, somewhere in here that we can look at. Um, and even with laws allowing portability, um, this requires some kind of uh, trust and oversight requires a stable and unionized employment base. Um, I wrote a paper in 2002 on multi-employer relationships, uh, uh, on regulation of multi-employer relationships. Um, it's really important for those regulations and rules to specify who comes in, who goes out, what the roles and responsibilities are, transparency to workers on those things, which I think U.S. institutions are not always so good at, um, and a clear plan for allocating risks and benefits. So that's all I had. So, you know, one Thanks. more presenter. Yeah.